So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm personally very happy that we can finally do an event at FIAF. Great organization. Um, if you're French or not, um, always a good idea to be a member of FIAF because it opens your mind on all the great things that France brings to, uh, to the world and um, also to the European Union. Great um, events, great um, cinema, language courses. So do look into FIAF. Um, but um, we're here to uh, um, welcome Pierre Moscovici, um, the Commissioner of the European Union in charge of the uh, taxes, um, the economy, and um, he will be talking to us about unfinished business for the outgoing Commission and what to expect with the new Commission coming in. And um, we have uh, uh, Richard Bales from Reuters um, interviewing the, uh, the conversation, running the conversation for us. We have a great relationship with Reuters, especially the Breaking Views team. And with that, I hand over to Richard to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne and uh, Pierre. Thank you for being here and um, all of you as well. And thank you to the European American Chamber of Commerce for hosting us here. I don't think I've managed to. I've lived in New York 16 years. I don't think I've managed to get inside this building until now. So. <laughs> so uh, that's great. Um, timing is interesting because you've been in this particular, many jobs at, over your career, but in this particular job nearly five years, you have about five weeks left, maybe exactly five weeks left today, I think. And I thought first, maybe just ask you to take stock a little, you know, what the, has the Juncker Commission achieved? What have you not achieved? How does Europe look different now from it, how it, or the outlook look different now from how it did five years ago? Well, first of all, thank you for uh, the American, uh, uh, Euro-American Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for the Alliance Francaise. It's also the first time that I happen to come here, which uh, might be strange. Uh, and I would like, sorry, I will take this phone out, um, to, to, to start with um, a few words uh, about uh, President Chirac, who um, disappeared this morning. It happens that um, I'm French, that I was also uh, his minister for five years during a, a long period uh, from 1997 to 2002 as European Affairs Minister already. And uh, he uh, was certainly one of the greatest uh, political faces in our country. He's been president for 12 years. He's been prime minister twice, twice, mayor of Paris for 20 years. He has been minister so many times. And Europe also owes him. Uh, we'll just take an example. Uh, he was rather your skeptic in his young time. But in 1992, when we uh, had a referendum on the European Union and also the creation of the euro uh, against his own camp, he chose the yes. It was very narrow victory, 51-49. And if he would have done another choice, maybe we don't have the euro today. But, well, it was also very pragmatic, uh, sympathetic, uh, charming uh, politician. And I feel uh, moved today, and I think that for the French people, I can imagine that from here it's a great loss because he was at some moments in his life a divisive man, but finally he uh, was kind of a father of the nation, creating unity, and also opposed the far right twice in his life. Uh, first in 1998, when there was a temptation to create an alliance with the far right uh, in regional elections, and then of course in 2002 when uh, he defeated Jean-Marie Le Pen, the father, uh, by 82%. Well, that's another story, but uh, I think that uh, I had to say that uh, here uh, today. Then, if I move to your question, unfinished business. By definition, uh, when you end the mandate, and that's the case for me in five weeks from now, uh, the business is as well finished, because well, that's over, basically, uh, and unfinished because uh, you never can achieve uh, all the goals that you had in the beginning in uh, five years. But I think that uh, I will leave this job and the commission will leave this job with some pride. Because if I look five years ago, sorry. <laughs> sorry, there are French journalists precisely about Jacques Chirac. <laughs> asking you for, to react. I was supposed to be on this and that TV the other day. 
if I look five years ago, but that's over with it now, it's silence. Uh, if I look five years ago, we were uh, at the end of the financial crisis, but the uh, European economy w was still doing very bad. Uh, public debt was booming, uh, deficits uh, were almost everywhere too high, uh, unemployment was at its highest uh, level, um, and people expected uh, a recovery. And when Jean-Claude Juncker took office, he said, we need to be the commission of the last chance. He meant by that the economic chance. If I look at the picture now today, uh, it's much better, of course. Uh, first, uh, Europe has now a solid growth, uh, as well in 2019 and 2020, also slow, but still very solid. Um, investment has picked up, consumption is very strong. Uh, it's a good place to do business, I really think so. And uh, you know that from some of you. Our deficits are now under 1% uh, of GDP. Our public debt is diminishing almost everywhere, uh, except in Italy, a bit in France too. Uh, as a commissioner for ECFIN, I would like it to be a little lower, but uh, you cannot compare France with Italy if you look at uh, the other fundamentals, of course. Unemployment um, has diminished, uh, and employment has grown, which is a different concept. There have never been so many people with a job uh, in Europe as today. I'm not saying that all of them have good jobs, but they have jobs. And so uh, I think we acted uh, in our place uh, to um, help this recovery, because it's a seven year of growth uh, in a row. Uh, especially in my field, what did we do? What did I do? You know, when you leave a, an office, the question is for legacy is, what would have been different with another guy? I think three things. First, this commission refused Brexit. One must remember that in 2014, the big issue was, should Greece exit the EU? And there were some of the uh, European members, states, uh, who advocated for that. I uh, remember my good friend, um, the person I re really respect, Wolfgang Schauble, he thought that we would be better with them out of the uh, Euro, uh, even temporarily. I was never, and Jean-Claude Juncker was never in this uh, idea. And you know that in 2018, after years of reform, debates, uh, Greece finally exited its program. It's no more an issue. Uh, we talk about Greece as a normal country in uh, the Eurozone. And it's also saved the uh, integrity of the Euro, because I'm quite sure that if Greece would have left the Euro, it would have been the beginning of the end, uh, because a currency is defined by its integrity. Um, the second thing that I think would have been different with another commission, and also with another commissioner, uh, is certainly the way we handled the deficit issue. Some, uh, very orthodox, uh, sometimes conservative, thought that when a country does not respect uh, the targets, uh, which are fixed by the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, it should be sanctioned. Uh, I never thought that sanction was an answer. I prefer incentives, I prefer dialogue, I prefer structural reforms to sanctions. And this commission never sanctioned any country, neither Italy, and uh, once or twice uh, were debates about that, neither Spain, neither Portugal, some even thought uh, about France, which uh, was absolutely absurd. And we succeeded in maintaining growth on the one hand, with uh, fiscal policies which are adapted, but on the other hand, reducing deficits and debts. And the third thing, uh, which I'm quite proud, is that we've made huge progress, but really massive, uh, in uh, the uh, corporate tax uh, regime. Uh, I could say that we have lived a revolution there, revolution of transparency. If I look at the way BEPS uh, has been impl in implemented, the uh, two directives on anti-tax avoidance that were uh, voted during these years, public country by country reporting, not yet public, but uh, already between member states, uh, the establishment of a blacklist of tax haven. Uh, we've done really a lot. I, I can even say that we've done more in those last five years than in 25 years before. It's not uh, mainly due or only due to my own merits, although I try to manage, it's due to the fact that the world has changed, that people cannot accept that multinationals don't pay their fair share of tax where they create profits and value. 
We didn't succeed in everything, and I want to finish by that. Um, my regrets would be uh, threefold. First, uh, we have not completed the euro yet, neither the banking union, uh, neither a budget for the eurozone, neither governance for the eurozone, and that's one of my regrets, and I think that is something the next commission must uh, certainly uh, move in that direction. Second, uh, on tax policy, uh, there are a lot of structural reforms which have not been completed either. I'm thinking about reforming VAT. Uh, I think about energy tax, and uh, this is also to me a priority for the next commission, and I think about digital tax. We tried to do that. And then my third regret, I would say, is more general, because these four, five years were years of crisis, not only economic, but also migration crisis, uh, also Brexit. And we muddled through, uh, but uh, the issues are still on the table. But that's quite logical uh, for two reasons. First, five years is a fixed term, and these problems are more long-lasting. Uh, and second, one must be conscious that the Commission is certainly what looks the most as the EU government, but it is not the EU government. Uh, the EU government is shared, uh, as Jean-Claude Juncker always says, we propose, they decide, they being the member states. And one must never forget that. I must say sometimes the ball is in the camp of the member states. I could just take an example. Uh, we had a discussion on a turnover tax on digital economy, not GAFA tax. I never spoke about GAFA tax, and I think it's a mistake to speak about the GAFA tax, but uh, digital tax, um, and it did not succeed simply because four member states opposed, and we need to have unanimity uh, there. Uh, so the Commission is not responsible for, uh, the Commission is always seen as responsible for the mistakes and never for the successes. I like to think that's a, a bit more of the contrary. That's a great list, and I'd love to come back to, we, we have a, a reasonable amount of time, we'll get back to quite a few of those topics. I have to say it's a, sad indictment of the short memories that journalists have that I'd almost forgotten about Greece and Grexit um, in preparing for this. But a different exit I'd have to talk about first, as you can tell, I'm a Brit. Brexit activity has been, or Brexit related activity has been pretty exciting this week in London. And I just wanted to come back to that for a little bit and try to um, just look at it a little from the EU's point of view. Um, we still don't know what the outcome is going to be. There are still three possible outcomes. Uh, Brexit with no deal, Brexit with a deal, or no Brexit. So we have no idea. This must be frustrating um, for your colleagues in Brussels, in the, in the Commission, in the EU. Do you have any insight as to where, how, how from that side of the, the debate people are, people are feeling? Is it just immense frustration? Uh, I wouldn't say frustration is the right word. Uh, first, we regretted the decision of the British people to exit the EU. Uh, we think, I think personally uh, very much, that we would be better with the UK in than with the UK out. But of course, we had to respect the vote of a referendum, and we still do. Uh, but mostly, it is a British decision and the solution is in the UK. It depends on the way we negotiate, of course, but the ball is mostly in the British camp. And as you said, this week was exciting, <laughs> the week before was exciting, <laughs> and it's becoming even more and more excited, <laughs> which is a bit uh, different, and I cannot comment on that. Just one comment. One thing that strikes me is whatever, uh, how harsh is the debate in the UK, your institutions, because you're Brit, resist. This is the oldest parliamentary democracy in the world. And, well, you cannot impose uh, the suspension of a parliament. You cannot resist a law voted by the parliament. You cannot neglect a decision of the Supreme Court. And that must be remembered, and I think it is of crucial importance for the weeks to come. If I come back to us, the EU, well, we took that with cool blood. And I think that is an example of what the EU can do. The 27 member states always negotiated with the UK, united, and with very firm principles. Maybe some would have expected or hoped divisions between us 
It never happened. The commission was a negotiator under the uh, leadership of the president. Uh, a negotiator was nominated, my, my predecessor as commissioner, Michel Barnier. And we always negotiated by saying, okay, they want to get out. They defend their own interest, but we will defend our interest and our principles. We cannot come back on the internal market. We cannot renounce to our customs union. And that's one of the reasons why there is this famous backstop between Northern and uh, uh, Southern or the Republic of Ireland, uh, and which of course is a problem for the UK, but it's m mandatory for us in the EU. And you may be sure that we will have that attitude until the last day. There is no way to divide the Europeans. There is no way to have us renouncing to our principles. And if solutions emerge, they will have to be compatible with this. They cannot be too creative. Uh, I cannot imagine that in the end there is a kind of a rush saying, okay, we don't want them to go out, so we do anything. That won't happen. We will stick to the principles and we will stick to our unity. Then, of course, three outcomes are possible. Again, it depends a lot on the UK. We never wanted the no deal. We think the no deal is a bad, bad conclusion, mostly for the UK, but also for the EU and for the world. Um, they, but uh, it's still possible, it depends on the timing. Uh, I noticed that the parliament uh, has required an extension, and this is a fact, uh, a political fact that needs to be uh, respected certainly. Uh, there is a, a, a deal, but we don't have the deal. Oh, we have a deal, but it's not approved by this parliament. And then there are other developments uh, which might lead to remain, who knows? Uh, but I think that at one moment, uh, since the political system is uh, in disarray in the UK, the British people will have to say their word through elections. I uh, don't know what kind of elections. Uh, it's up to them to decide, but uh, you need to come back to the people. Because there was a lie there. I, I spoke about the referendum of uh, 1992. Um, in France, we are a country with a lot of referendums, and we lost two of them. The first one in 1969, the General de Gaulle was president. He uh, ha ha ordered a referendum on regional uh, organization. He lost it at midnight. He was not in power. In 2005, there was a referendum on the European Constitution. The French voted against, the Dutch voted against. At midnight, it was over. Some people thought in the UK that by voting with Brexit, the day after they would be out. And there was a lie, because one should have told them that it would take years to dismantle and to reorganize the very strong linkage you have with the rest of the EU members when you're part of the union. So just to pick up on, if we assume there's an, there's an exit with or without a deal, so you won't have the UK in the EU anymore. First, I guess, how much damage does that do potentially to, um, to the EU? Because we heard a lot from the Leave side about how the EU needed the UK more than the UK needs the EU, which if you, if you look at the numbers doesn't seem right. Um, the sheer weight of GDP or whatever you want to look at doesn't seem right, but there could be some damage. And I guess the other side of that would be the change in the balance of influence, opinion, whatever within the EU, because you know, I think the UK has been maybe not an outlier, but on one end of the discussion within Europe for, for many years and, and how that might change the outlook and the, the way that the politics works in Europe, I guess. Well, uh, the Brexit, uh, anyhow, especially the no deal Brexit, would create problems. First and foremost, for the UK. The other figures are <coughs> pitiless. Uh, the figures from the uh, Bank of England, for example, my friend Mark Carney delivers, it's a loss of the GDP from 5 to 8% immediately. That's a lot. The supply chains uh, would have to be reorganized, and that wouldn't be in the benefit of the UK. A few months ago, I went to Hamburg uh, to visit my friend Olaf Scholz, uh, who was the mayor of Hamburg and now the Minister of Finance. I visit Airbus in Hamburg, A320. Uh, the, the most important uh, engine from Airbus is uh, built there. And they told me, we need to export a part of the wing, the wings from UK. If it takes, after uh, Brexit disorganized, 
two or three weeks, we will have to invent something different. And so the consequences for the industry will be consequent everywhere, but massive for the UK. Uh, the uh, automotive industry, uh, the aircraft industry, for example. Of course, it would also be bad for us, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, for them it's several points of GDP. For us it would be a few percentage points of GDP. That's quite different, but it would be also different for the world. I think that for the EU, the main problem is strategic or geopolitical. Uh, again, where is the UK? The problem with the UK is that it was always a particular European country, that the European culture was not uh, totally adopted by uh, the uh, British people and by the British politicians. A uh, few of uh, your prime ministers have been pro-European. In 97, I was with Tony Blair for five years. I know him well. He's a friend. He was a pro-European. But even him, uh, when the, the point was to decide whether the UK should join the EU, the Euro or not, he couldn't do that because he was uh, opposed by some members of uh, his party, including a, another uh, good friend who became Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, with uh, his famous conditions. And so, well, that's particular. But I think that the UK, even out of the EU, will be a European country. I, we're here in the US. Uh, President Trump speaks about fantastic, uh, formidable uh, free trade agreements with the UK. No dream. Uh, the UK will be always closer to the EU than with uh, the US. The time of the special relationship, I think, I would say it's gone, but it will be uh, less important than in the past, of course, due to the world as it is. And so uh, when I sit, because I represent the EU in the G20 or G7 meetings, I feel that with our British friends, I'm with Europeans, uh, and that they need to uh, st stay there or be very close to us, whatever happens. And finally, uh, if I imagine a, a EU or 27, that might be a, an occasion to be more united. And we showed in the negotiation that we could do that. And one way to be uh, more and more united is to expand the role of the euro, uh, which is, uh, I think, the, the, the most uh, important factor of unity that we get right now. It's a club. It's a club of 19 member states representing some 85% of GDP after the Brexit. And that is uh, where we need to be more united than ever. Right, so just to continue a little on the politics of Europe, if you like. I know you're a student of politics, um, and you've been in politics and government for a very long time. Um, so even without Brexit, there, are, there have been some changes. You've got different kinds of parties elected. You've got maybe a more fragmented group of parties elected um, to the European Parliament, and in the different member countries. Uh, Angela Merkel is coming to the end of her tenure. Um, President Macron has sort of tried to set out, <coughs> excuse me, a vision of, of some sort. But there's there's other fragmentation within the EU 27, and you talk about you know increasing the role of the euro, fiscal unity, uh, fiscal union, all all of that. Is that really realistic, just in big picture, with this more fragmented Europe, even even without the UK? <coughs> I don't know if it's totally <laughs> realistic, but I know that it's absolutely necessary. Because if I look at U Europe as it is, it is still a continent of high influence, but of course, due to our demography, uh, our weight in the world is diminishing, and due also to uh, growth in the emerging uh, countries, our uh, percentage in GDP has been uh, divided by two in some 30 years. We were 14%, we are 7% now. And we must take this into account. And the only way for us to play a leading role, uh, as well economically and politically, is to build a political unity. Divided, we fail. Uh, of course, I talked about the Constitution. The motto of the Constitution was uh, united in diversity. We are diverse. We will stay diverse. We are 27 countries, each of them with their culture. Um, almost each of them with their language, uh, uh, each of them with their political system, and we must respect that. We are not going to be the United States of Europe, even if some regret that, not for a very long time.
but we need to be more united than we do. We need to have a, a defense policy, which is uh, way stronger than it is. Uh, we need to uh, enhance our foreign policy. We need to have a common voice uh, in uh, those international forums I mentioned, such as IMF, G7, G20, the financial forums, of course, but they are you know, totally decisive today. And we need uh, also to, to build a common security. And for all of this, we need to have a linkage with the UK. Because how to imagine a European defense with one of the two nuclear powers out of the EU and no relationship between uh, uh, this power and the other power with being France. And so, uh, Madame von der Leyen, you know, I said, President Juncker said, our commission is a political commission, meaning that we had strong policies to lead. She said, we want to be a geopolitical commission. Basically, I approve that. I think she's right. Uh, the moment to, to unite politically Europe uh, for, for it to be a listen to in the very complex and dangerous world we live in uh, is absolutely necessary. <laughs> I'm speaking about the G20. It happens that I've been there for quite a while because I was first finance minister for my country for two years, then commissioner for five, seven years at the table. Imagine the table today. I'm not talking about President Trump and the US, I will be careful. But the other guys, uh, Putin, Xi Jinping, Modi, uh, the air prince of Saudi Arabia, Mr. Bolsonaro, Erdogan. Well, all of them are strong leaders. With all of them, the French diplomacy discusses uh, because it's a very pragmatic one. But they don't represent the precise model of what a liberal democracy is. And for that, Europe has well to say. Uh, I'm proud to be with the Germans, the Italians, and the French, of course, uh, and uh, uh, who do I forget? The Brits around the table and with our Canadian cousins. Uh, but that's little. And so we need to uh, structure that. Then, of course, as you said, there is fragmentation, there are contradictions. And one thing that must be watched in the years to come is, of course, the succession of Angela Merkel. Because she's a, such a strong leader for so long time that imagining who will succeed her, what kind of coalition with a more fragmented political spectrum uh, is a very, very important question. Furthermore, Germany is the strongest uh, economic power in Europe. It's also the defender of very orthodox positions. Can it change? I think it must. Will it change? I don't know. So even the rules you have already, let's say, or the common rules that the growth and stability pact I'm talking about here. Um, I think those with a superficial knowledge like me th know this is the rules which say countries are not supposed to have more than a 3% deficit of GDP and 60% debt to GDP. There are some serial offenders. I mean, France on paper a little bit, Italy more recently. Um, Germany, on the other hand, nobody can persuade the Germans, as what one of my colleagues put it when I was asking what questions I should ask you today said, how, how, how is your successor going to persuade the stingy Germans to start spending some money? So we, we, you know, we already have some of these rules or ideas of, of unity or common standards which, which are not really being met and haven't consistently been met. Um, how do you even deal with that? And are, are deficits so terrible? Are those rules the right rules? Or maybe in more subtle ways that needs to change? First, I'm... Um satisfied that my successor will be on the same political line as I am. <laughs> I would say rather flexible because he's a former prime minister for a G7 country, Italy, uh, Paolo Gentiloni, and I think that he will be also somebody who will resist a kind of a old old liberal, uh, purely orthodox approach, which I think is not the right one if you want to, to, to sustain growth. You need to be very rigorous, very serious when uh, fiscal policy is concerned but also flexible, because you don't want to damage growth. And the risk, if you are too severe, is that growth is damaged and that no jobs can be created. Uh, that's the first uh, remark. Second remark, I think the time has come to have a, a different response as far as fiscal policy uh, is concerned. First, now the deficits are not at 3%. They're under 1% in average. And even the countries you mentioned, Italy and France, are around 2.2%. Uh, 
uh, it's not the best performance, but it's still way uh, under the 3%. Um, and so the moment might come when, uh, if there is a slowdown in growth, and we see that there are obviously downside risks uh, everywhere, geopolitical tensions, uh, trade tensions, uh, Brexit, uh, possible uh, moves in Italy, etc. Um, if uh, the slowdown would materialize, it's high time that we have a coordinated approach between those countries with high deficits and debt. They need to be serious and to continue reducing it. Uh, that's Italy, mostly. Uh, France must go on controlling its public finances. But again, the situation is not at all comparable. Just look at the spreads uh, of France and Italy and you'll see the difference in credibility between the two countries. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there are countries like Germany and Netherlands uh, with huge surpluses, over savings, some 9% uh, surplus in external trade for Germany, what for? Um, and uh, with a, a deficit which is under 0%. And at one moment, these countries, I think, must, I wouldn't say relax their discipline, but spend more, invest more. One thing that struck me uh, <laughs> two days ago was the fact that the BDI, the BDI is the, the uh, German industry uh, representatives, said that it's time to have a, a, a different approach. And that's very significant. So I think that moment of coordination approaches. And then, to end with, um, our rules, uh, as every rule, needs to be adapted. They are 10 years old. They were defined during the crisis. Uh, um, pragmatically, we, I wouldn't say change them, but uh, modify the way we use them. Uh, the Juncker Commission was not the Barroso Commission about that. Barroso Commission was uh, really orthodox. The Juncker Commission was flexible. And now it's time that we th reflect on how these rules can be amended. I wouldn't say change, but amended. There are some details. I'm not going to in insist too much on that, but some notions like structural deficit that uh, uh, happen to be quite complex. We need them to be simple. We need them to have one objective alone, and this objective to me is to control public debt, uh, because public debt is the enemy of the economy. Uh, we cannot, uh, we don't have a dollar, so we cannot be uh, over indebted. Uh, so, well, uh, <coughs> but this will be also a debate for the next commission and for the member states. Because again, the Commission proposes, but on that field especially, member states decide. And the German debate right. will be, of course, crucial then. And that's why also the, 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 the end of the mandate of Madame Merkel, the fact that she will be uh, at the head of the European Union in the second semester of 2020, um, is something those who are attached to Europe must follow closely. But I mean, is there enough scope for change in Germany that they, that you know any German regime could be persuaded to spend more? I mean, uh, there's a the tradition in Germany, uh, uh, which is now old of the century, uh, the memory of overinflation, the culture of stability, which is in the German constitution of 1949, and so you cannot expect uh, any German politician to be, uh, we'd say, in a fantasy. This will not happen. But at one moment, uh, they might realize that their own interest for their own sake and for their own economy is to have more investment, is to spend more for their own growth, for their own infrastructure, and for the uh, rest of the EU and especially Eurozone uh, sake. Because you know, uh, in this year, in 2019, growth in the EU will be around 1.1, 1.3%, 1 depends on the forecast. It will be some 0% in Italy, 0.5% in Germany. And that proves that at one moment, some models can be adapted again, modified, amended. Right. And That's this, I think, will come in the German debate too. There's a sort of related question, I suppose, which is, you know, this all is a partly a question of which countries can borrow to spend, which have no borrowing capacity. Um, there's been a discussion at various times looking more, more positive and less positive about European-wide bonds that are backed ultimately in some way by all 27 countries in a sort of pooled 
way, where does that stand? Is that going anywhere? Is that something the next commission should be excited about or not? For the time being, it's absolutely nowhere. Uh, and this is not the, the, the kind of uh, proposal that uh, has a tremendous success in the German audience. Um, when I became finance minister in 2012, the French authorities of the time proposed it and, well, it was a bit cold uh, in the atmosphere at this moment. But uh, I think what we need is to have a, a Eurozone budget, especially in order to invest and reduce inequalities, and probably somewhere a, a stable financial asset uh, that is common uh, in order to solidify the euro too. But for now, so which needs to come first, I guess, the budget or the, the bonds? The budget for me is a priority. I think that uh, um, uh, the euro, to be completed, needs that financial asset, stable asset, needs to have a, a budget, needs to have a, another governance um, with a better democratic control, uh, a minister of finance for the EU, for example, controlled by the European Parliament. Uh, President Macron made these proposals during his um, presidential campaign and then in the beginning of his mandate. Um, we don't talk too much about that now. But for me, they are the right ones. Okay, so there's another elephant in the room, especially with the UN meeting down the road, which is climate change. And I mean, it struck me looking at the letter Jean-Claude Juncker wrote to you five years ago and the letter that Ursula von der Leyen has written to her commissioner the, and all her commissioners. There's a dramatic difference in the emphasis on climate change, the environment, all these things, and many things have happened in five years. The Paris Accord happened within those five years. The science around climate change has solidified and so on. But where, I mean, Europe at least has Europe-wide carbon pricing and different countries in Europe have taken steps to at least set targets for themselves, reasonably long-term targets, I guess. Could the UK Commission have done more on this? Is it up to the countries or is this super priority for the, for the next commission, do you think? It's always a temptation uh, to look back to the past with the glasses of today. Uh, I don't know how it's called in, it's called in French, Uchronia. And we must not have too much Uchronic vision. Uh, because uh, five years ago, uh, the level of conscious, consciousness on those issues was not the same. But still, I must say that the Europeans are obviously the leaders in that matter. The Paris Agreement was signed in Paris, under the chairmanship of somebody uh, your council knows well, the former uh, Foreign Affairs Minister Laurent Fabius. Uh, they were ambitious, and the Commission played a central role there. And we are th the most important financiers of fighting climate change in the world, by far. Um, and this commission also launched a, a massive investment plan called the Euclid Plan. Uh, and one of the uh, targets was and is climate change. Uh, one thing on which I said we didn't succeed, and that's my regret, is that we couldn't propose an intelligent way of taxing energy. Uh, there was an opposition as well in the commission and in member states. And if I just give a, a legacy or a a message to my successor is his priority must be taxation of energy, compatible with our uh, climate change goal. Uh, then we must also uh, reorganize the uh, Juncker plan, called now InvestEU, for this priority, which is greening uh, the economy. That's why the President of the Commission talks about the Green Deal. President Macron again proposed uh, a, a bank for climate. I think he's right, but with a nuance, that is that this bank already exists. It is the European Investment Bank. The tools are there, the money is there, and we need to spend trillions of euros in order to, for example, renew our housing. And so, uh, obviously, it will be among the two to three priorities of the next commission, um, and the Europeans uh, want to stay in the lead there. And I think that uh, they will obviously. But we've done our share. And how do you feel about the 
global buy-in to that. Obviously, the U.S. is an outlier at one end. There's big India and China are becoming are or are becoming giant economies and giant polluters as well. I mean, wh what's your sense of whether the collective action, the will for collective action, is there? I think that nobody has escapes the uh, necessity to fight climate change. Uh, I've been, as you said, in politics for quite a while. Uh, uh, I've been going to Beijing, for example, I don't know how many times in my life. Uh, it's quite different today than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. You can breathe there. You see the sky. Uh, of course, uh, maybe the plants have been expelled somewhere else. Uh, not saying that's a model, but everybody realizes that pollution is unacceptable. And in China, they don't have a public opinion with the elections, etc. but they have a public opinion saying we don't want that pollution. Uh, Russia uh, joined the club. India is considering. So I think that with different speed, uh, the, the, the move is universal. And even the US, uh, Donald Trump, of course, uh, withdrew uh, the belonging of the US to the Paris Agreement, and I deeply regret that. But there are other actors. I was yesterday in an event organized by Michael Bloomberg. Uh, the cities, uh, the uh, business, uh, act on their side and so that the US are also in the camp. So you need to mobilize all stakeholders, not only states. Uh, you need to have the international community playing a leading role. And you need to have organizations such as the EU uh, to be really in the driving engine. And we can be, I'm sure we will be. I mean, we'll, we'll open it up for questions a little later and we can explore this more if that particular issue more. But another one where some global will is required is digital taxation. And I think the perspective from here in the States is a little bit, you, you said we shouldn't call it the GAFA tax, which is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Um, but I think that's a little how it's perceived here, that if you're because the companies that happen to be big in that area are American companies. The tendency here is to say, well, those Europeans couldn't develop these companies themselves. They just want to tax the ones uh, created over in Silicon Valley. Um, but of course, there is a problem in figuring out under old tax structures where a company's revenue, revenue and profit are made and how that should be taxed. It's, 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 a, it's a challenge and things need to change. So how? How do you address that in Europe? I know there have been attempts to do that within Europe, but it's, it's much more than a European problem, right? Of course, it's a global problem that needs to be addressed at the global level, and that's why the relevant uh, forum is uh, obviously OECD, and that's where we are trying to explore uh, issues and uh, solutions. Uh, but what is the problem? As I said, we are living in a revolution of transparency. From FATCA, then the G20 of Los Cabos, a global agenda emerged on taxation, which was led by this uh, first and foremost idea. It's impossible when we ask citizens to pay their fair share of tax to reduce deficits, to have multinationals, because there are loopholes in the rules, uh, because there are no rules, because they've got a, an army of lawyers, etc., to avoid paying their fair share of tax where they create profits and value. And this is particularly true for the digital economy. Why? Uh, first, because corporate taxation was designed one century ago with the idea of physical presence. Well, I've, I've been for 20 years an MP, a congressman in my country. I was uh, elected in an uh, industrial area. Now there is the big biggest automotive plant in France. Quite simple, I know how many people work there. I know how many cars are produced. Uh, I know what is the profit generated. So taxing this uh, is absolutely simple. For digital sector, you don't know any of these notions. There is nothing such as digital presence or digital stable establishment. And we need to build it. Uh, and I think that nobody denies that. When I speak with, to Steven Mnuchin of the, those ideas, the our American friends are conscious that there is an issue. Then. Uh, there is the idea of the GAFA tax, and I, I clearly uh, am against it because it's not only about those four companies. It's about the, all the digital economy, and we must again have principles there. 
the tax I proposed, the uh, turnover tax, the European turnover tax, was not for four companies, but for some 150 companies. It's true that half of them were American, because there is a strong leadership of the US in that field, but a third was European, the rest was mostly uh, Asian. Uh, and I think that we must go on with that. Uh, if I compare uh, what we know about the uh, average uh, tax rate for, I would say, normal or old-fashioned companies, it's 23% in the EU. For digital economy, it's 9%. There are a problem of level playing field. You've seen that my colleague, uh, Margaret Vestager, said that Apple, one of those four companies, uh, had to pay 13 billion euros to the Irish Treasury for the account of the all Europe because the average taxation was some 0.05% in Ireland. Is that normal? No. So we need to, to, to find ways there. Uh, we had a common European uh, answer possible with a turnover tax and then with uh, uh, an adoption of digital presence. We didn't succeed because four member states, namely Ireland, Denmark, Finland and Sweden, did not accept that. Now there are discussions which take place at uh, the uh, OECD level. I hope they will be uh, successful in 2020. At the G7, there was a tough discussion between President of the US and President of France. And finally, they agreed on the idea to agree, not yet uh, an agreement on substance, but uh, a process. And I hope this will be uh, successful, even if we've got some differences of approach uh, with our American friends. For example, we want to tax the digital economy and they want to tax the immaterial economy. What is the immaterial economy? It's everything that incorporates uh, digital, but everything incorporates digital. I imagine that in Germany, they're not that enthusiastic about uh, taxing the BMW or the Mercedes, uh, but well, that's the rest of the discussion. I'm quite sure that we'll make progress, but the problem is that these progress need to be significant. Uh, the risk al al always at the if you speak at a too large forum, which is a forum of coordination, is that you've got rules, and that's good. That's PEPs, for example. But after that, you need to do more at your uh, internal market level. So, I mean, one thing that would make the discussion easier would be if some of these giant companies were European. And oh, it can be an accident of history that they're not. Um, it, I, I think it's an interesting question. That and there's another one I want to ask after this, sort of on this general theme, is is what is the, is there a reason they're not? Is it an accident of history? Is there, do you think there's an innovation problem in Europe? Which I mean, again, I think from here, not to be too simplistic, there's a perception that Silicon Valley is the center of innovation in the world, that the Europeans are not very good at this. I think there's some evidence that's not the case, but nonetheless, the giant corporations happen to be from here? Uh, it's clear that uh, the European have all the necessary capacities and skill uh, to be as innovative as the US. Uh, and uh, I see a lot of companies that could become the next tech giant. Uh, the problem is to help startups to become scale-ups and scale-ups to become giants. Uh, and for that, we need, I think, several things. First, we need to have a, a single market, a digital single market. The problem is that we've had 27 or 28 regulators, 28 markets, and if you're too divided, then you're weak. That's the first thing. Second, we lack investment. And that's why uh, one of the targets of the Juncker Plan is digital economy. And uh, InvestEU will be on climate change and digitalization. Sometimes both are linked, of course. Uh, that's the second thing uh, we lack. Um, and then we need to have an all environment and taxation comes in this environment. I'm hopeful that we can make progress on that, uh, but uh, it needs a change of mindset, a change of structures. Uh, I think that we've got all the uh, capacities. Uh, there are already very important and significant European uh, uh, tech companies or digital companies, but they need to grow. We don't have such a, a, a complete and global thing as Silicon Valley. And we should invest there. You, we spoke before uh, uh, of VivaTech, uh, which is a very important uh, public um, meeting taking pl place in Paris. I can see that uh, all the forces are there, but we need to mobilize them, unite them, 
give them the means to invest in the right context legally. Right, so I, I hope you're getting ready with your questions. I have one more for Pierre and then we'll throw it open for you. your no doubt more in, incisive questions than mine. But I was talking, sitting down with some of my colleagues around, the, around our newsroom table and we were talking about Europe and one of the, somebody said, well, one of the things, when you think about it, we talk to a lot of different people in finance and to some extent in government. Nobody lately has, when, when you ask them, right, what, what are the bright spots you see in the world? What are the things that keep you up at night? When we look at the bright spots, nobody lately has said, you should invest in Europe. The, the, the place is Europe. In fact, the, the mainstream view seems to be growth is slow. I'm just not interested right now. Now, again, I'm simplifying to, to provoke a reaction. What's, what's the investment, the selling story for Europe right now, would you say? Uh, that's not what I see, simply. When I look at foreign direct investment, the flow is uh, probably higher than ever. Um, and everybody knows, and our immigrant friends know, and a lot of people from this country who invest in Europe, in France too, that now we have a very stable and long-lasting environment. Uh, again, our growth is solid, although too slow. Uh, we've got a workforce which is among the best in the world, all skills, training. Um, I think that now our tax systems and our fiscal policies are pro-business, much more than they were a few years or decade away. Uh, and so that's precisely the place or the countries in which one can invest. And I don't think that we need to work too much on the pitch for a single reason, is that the businessmen don't need a pitch. Uh, they look simply at reality and they see that there are a lot of opportunities. Why, finally? Because, of course, with all our limits, our fragmentation, our political difficulties, we are, alongside the US, the strongest economy in the world. We've got a large internal market of something like 500 million people with high purchasing power, uh, who now are looking at all the innovations, uh, at all ages, at all stages, and this internal market simply cannot be neglected, must not be neglected. That's why, as well, investing, trading, sailing is good in Europe, and especially between the US and Europe, since I'm in this wonderful country. Great, so let's please, well, let's start right here. First, those low interest rates intervened precisely because at one moment, in order to sustain growth, our central banks thought that it was the time to inject liquidities in the economy. That's what Mario Draghi for the ECB did in 2012, and he was right. I've got the greatest admiration for what he did, his leadership, his communication. Uh, he's among the guy who saved the euro, and he did that through QE. Then, of course, uh, it has always positive effects and less positive effect, for example, for the banking sector. But the banking sector needs to be reinforced in its own side. That's why we try to do with the um, banking union. To answer your questions, very delicate. Uh, the economists try, the uh, central bankers try, and neither an economist, neither a central banker, although I know well about central bankers and a bit about the economy. Um, I would say first, yes, the interest rates are probably going to be very low for quite a while. Second, you don't know what low means. It, it is that low, negative interest rates, or a bit higher. And third, but that's uh, my definition, they won't be that low forever. And that's why we need also, as Christine Lagarde from uh, IMF uh, uh, MD, and now president of the ECB in a few weeks from here says, we need to repair the roof while the sun is shining. And at this moment, there are some drops of rain in the, the roof. 
not here. <laughs> not, not at the Alliance Francaise, of course, but uh, in, the, uh, in the world economy. And we need to be prepared. That's why, for example, I think those who believe, I have this discussion with a lot of economists, which are my friends, saying, okay, uh, since the interest rates are so low, we must not take care about debt for the time being because it's so cheap. True and wrong. It's true because it's cheap, it's wrong because at one moment it won't be that cheap. And you must not neglect public debt. First, uh, answer about the dollar. That's uh, an easier <laughs> response for me. Uh, the dollar is, of course, the uh, most important currency in the world with a, a dominating international role. Um, and I think that we, with the euro, must not have the idea to compete with the dollar. But we must have the idea that we must be capable of leading our own economic action internationally on our own. I will take an example. When unilateral sanctions happen, such as in Iran, the, the US, because they have the dollar, can impose to their partners not to uh, be active economically. And it's a point on which we don't share the view of the United States, even if there are problems. Uh, but still, we think the agreement which was signed before was moving in the right direction, although it needs to be uh, improved. Uh, and it's a shame that our companies cannot trade or intervene or act in Iran. I said that uh, I was elected for a long time in an area in France where they produce cars. It was Peugeot. Uh, for Peugeot, the loss of the uh, Iranian uh, market is a considerable loss. And that's for that. We need to build financial vehicles that are capable to intervene in Euro, even when there are unilateral sanctions. That's what we are starting reflecting on. I must be uh, clear, we're just at the start of it, and this must be clearly accelerated. But uh, again, the idea is not to compete against the dollar. To compete is to be fully independent and to have our own international role, even when we differ on some geopolitical visions uh, in some areas. Uh, unilateralism is not the right answer in any dimension, and even not in the monetary field. That's why we need to strengthen the role, international role of the rule. For the rest, uh, my mandate expires the 1st of November, and maybe I will surprise you, but nothing is prepared. Uh, I, I had that uh, feeling that ethically, it's very difficult to be in a job and to prepare the next one. Uh, you don't feel comfortable with this. Uh, now I can start thinking about that because in five weeks from now, the commission will be over and then the, the, our successors are now trying to get their ways through uh, the European Parliament. So I'm, I start to have some ideas. But after all, I've been seven years in a kind of government, two years in the French government, five years in the commission. That's a bit exhausting. Uh, so I will need uh, fresh ideas, uh, good moments. Um, and then I will, uh, I'm open to opportunities. Um, but uh, I'm not going to retire. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to be a retired MP. And I am, that's sad for that because of the age. I'm going to be a retired commissioner. But uh, no, no retirement for me. So I will try to look. And, you know, in my life, public life, uh, political life, I've been interested in three things. First, I love my country. I will start by that. Sorry to say that, I'm a European, but I'm, I'm French. And uh, I've been dedicated a lot of time to my country as an MP, as a minister, as a local uh, body uh, leader. And so uh, I want to serve my country. Second, I always did that with a, a commitment, which was a European commitment. 
it happens that I was uh, elected a member of the European Parliament 25 years ago. I was then the youngest. I mean, it would have been it's a long time ago. Uh, but I, I've done almost all jobs in the EU. You know, there are three institutions. The Council, I've been seven years in the Council. The Parliament, I've been six years in the Council. And, and among them, three years as a Vice President of the European Parliament. The Commission, five years. Well, I've got a bit of experience there and commitment uh, and a lot of Europe. And I want to go on promoting the uh, European vision and European ideas. And third, I'm a politician from the center left. Uh, my idea is that uh, you need social democracy because you need as well social cohesion and democracy. And these are two things that are not so popular for the time being uh, when you see uh, how populist, uh, far-right nationalists are powerful. So I can imagine that uh, uh, my next life will be about uh, the same. France, Europe, center-left. <laughs> That's a bit vague. <laughs> but well, uh, opens a lot of avenues. A lot of economists think that we have invented a new era. It's a strange moment. We have no inflation, whatever happens. How did it vanish? It's difficult for a central bank to pursue its uh, inflation goals because it, they are always under. Uh, I've been forecasting the EU economy for five years and each time I say, okay, we are progressing 1.4, 1.6 and each year it was under. Uh, we're living in a, a world with negative interest rates. Uh, we're living in a world with quite flat cycles, after all. We're in the seventh year in a row of growth, but except in 2017 and 18, it was not fantastic growth, but it's growth. We can create jobs without growth. If you look at Germany, for example, they are at full employment. We can destroy jobs with growth. So we're in a, a, a strange moment when uh, I think that I don't fear recession, neither for the US, neither for the EU. What I feel is to have that long-term, slow growth regime. And for that, we need to have structural reforms that are capable of enhancing the potential growth of our economies. And that's particularly true for the EU. And that means skills, training, education, productivity, which is the problem in a lot of EU countries. Let's speak about Italy, for example. The problem in Italy is mostly productivity. Uh, and we must um, have also strong support to investment. Uh, and finally, we need to reduce inequalities in Europe. I've had a long political life. And one thing that struck me is that there are parts of the country who move apart from each other, uh, that metropolis, big cities, getting better and better. Uh, if, if you are an investor, you, you move to Paris or to Lyon, or to, it's a your fantastic places. And uh, we had a dinner two days ago organized by Yvonne, and the investor said, we, we feel really well in France now. But there are other parts of France where nothing's alive. Or, or I would say life is very difficult. And that's what created the Gilets Jaunes movement. Gilets Jaunes are not People moved by an ideology. I know them. They were my voters. There are people who have been buying a house 20 years ago, and this house today has no value. They cannot move. Jobs have been destroyed, and they are told to be mobile. They cannot go away. They depend on their car, to, uh, and they don't want to have a, uh, limited speed or to pay too much for the uh, fuel, especially diesel. And those people feel that they are left apart. And you cannot leave people apart. 
if we want our societies and political system to be long-lasting, if we want liberal democracy to be again there for quite a while, then you need absolutely to, to adapt not only our institutions but also our policy. That's a few range of questions. I, I don't think we are going to get back to the uh, 30 years with a 5% growth, but I think that the EU potential growth can be enhanced uh, between 1 to 2%. I think, I think you also just described... From one to two. <laughs> I think you also just described quite a few um, Donald Trump voters in what you said about people isolated in that way. Um, I think that's where you were going with. Yeah, please. Um, how do you see the kind of countries looking at you, especially in the near future, as aggregates of, of the changes? How do you see them as currencies and in actions and you know, taxation and blah, blah, blah? How do you think... Very hard to say. I think uh, I, I tried to answer this question uh, in uh, the discussion. Um, you, basically, you said transatlantic business specifically, right? So yeah. yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say the Brexit is not going to change anything, but it's not going to change things decisively. Um, of course, there is again that dream of a special relationship restored between the UK and the US and there might be some free trade agreements, but th there is not very strong economic integration with the EU. And I'm quite sure that even with the Brexit, which is still the most likely option, even if uh, all options are open now, uh, the, the UK will remain a, a European country. And that's why I reject, no, I reject, I would regret the idea of a no deal. We need any kind of deal at one moment because we need to be really close to each other. Then, of course, there is a question of uh, relationship with the US, uh, and uh, we need to be um, in the same boat. Uh, when President Trump, Trump spoke, unfortunately, as Europeans, that his enemies makes no sense. Makes no sense politically. Uh, we owe so much to the Americans who came in our country to die to help us to get free again during two world wars. Uh, initially, the, the ones who came here were Europeans. We have shared values, hopefully. Uh, we have a lot of cultural uh, similarities. And so it makes no sense to consider ourselves as enemies. It makes also no sense to have any trade tensions between us. Uh, you cannot say that uh, digital tax is a matter uh, to uh, tax uh, wine in France. That, that was avoided, lucky. And so uh, we must still have a common agenda between uh, the EU, Europe as such, and the US. I thought you had a question on Hungary. We cannot reject, uh, by principle, Chinese investments. Uh, and we must be also in a very strong relationship with this partner, which is now becoming one of the two strongest economies in the world, one of the three strongest economies in the world, with the UN and US. But we must be also very careful, uh, as you said, on corruption, on data, uh, on also keeping the sovereignty some of our productions. I think that's the right attitude. The problem is that the answer cannot easily be defined at the EU level. And that for that, we need to be much more offensive ourselves in investing. I see investments, uh, Chinese investments in Greece. 
I see Chinese investment in Italy. I see Chinese investments in Portugal. Okay, I can say it should be another way, but it would be much better if there were European investments in Greece, in uh, Portugal, or in Italy. And so uh, the answer also relies on us and our capacity to develop uh, positive initiatives to invest more. That's the best answer. With, of course, data control, fighting corruption, etc. I think you're a bit too severe for the French banking sector. Uh, not French, European banking sector. Um, I spoke about France because especially the uh, banking sector in France has improved a lot and is very solid. If I compare uh, to 2014 or 2008, not to mention that, uh, there has been a lot of reforms that are called banking union through supervision, through resolution. Um, there have been a lot of recapitalization in our banking sector. And globally, we see no systemic risk for the European banking sector, even if there are inequalities here or there. There are obviously some German banks that need uh, restructuring. Uh, we need to monitor, and we have done that, some Portuguese, Italian banks, and uh, the uh, Digicomp and uh, the EU as such made it. But I think that, well, all in all, we've got a quite solid now banking sector, and the right answer is to complete banking union. Uh, but uh, no, uh, you are speaking, um, it's not a criticize, um, criticism in my uh, mind, as if nothing had been done during, uh, after the financial crisis, a lot has been done. And we believe that our banking sector is now capable of facing uh, also financial uh, difficulties. But I think, I, I mean, that's part of it. A solid base is one thing, but you, you know, we, we deal a lot looking at deals and IPOs and M&A and you know, in the, on the global sort of investment banking side, you, know, you, you may think that's not great business for banks, and in some, and it, in some cases it has been terrible business in the past, but the European banks have kind of faded away and given that ground to the big US banks. Um, and it's taken longer, perhaps, to solidify the European banking system than it did with the US banking system, so maybe that's a lag, but it does seem, like as the gentleman says, there's there's some on the global stage, there's some been some pullback. The, the European presence is perhaps not what it was and not what it could be. That may be true, but I think that uh, sp specifically with uh, structural reforms and uh, now Sonder situation, our banks are capable to regain ground. And they're not so weak either. Uh, but maybe again, my look is too much on the French banks because I was finance minister in France. And well, these banks behave quite well, yeah. and also globally. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I would like to come back to the Eastern Bank for a moment. Um, would you um, be able to give us a look into the crystal ball if there, um, what the, if it's going to be across the board, are there certain industries that uh, may get a top out because they are out of funding um, because of the PPP, either for PPP reporting or I cannot look in the crystal ball. I know that uh, discussions are ongoing on OECD. I think there is a positive political agenda now uh, that everybody is in agreement that the solution must be found there. But we don't have an agreement now. And we still have a lot of work to do in order to get there. Uh, what I hope is that in 2020, we will have the minimal basis for such a taxation, meaning as well principal uh, and minimal taxation precisely. Uh, but I know that there are still a lot of obstacles that uh, the point of views need to be reapproached. And the risk is that finally we have something in the OECD but is, which is too weak. So I cannot say exactly where it stands uh, and it um, lands. But uh, I think we're on the right track now.
Can I come back? We just got a few minutes, I think, right? Um, you, you mentioned in inequality just once, but I, I think it's something you're, um, you've been quite interested in and care about. What, you know, we, had, you, we have similar issues potentially here in the US too. People talk about universal basic income. People have done experiments on that. There are obviously, you, you mentioned education, skills, all those things. What, what are the, and this is a high level, perhaps philosophical question almost, but what, how do you see those inequalities being resolved or at least um, eroded, whether in Europe or anywhere else? I think that there are horizontal actions that absolutely need to be pursued. Uh, you talked about skill, I think education, equality of opportunities, reforming the social system is absolutely key there. Uh, it must be inequality between individuals, uh, equality of chances, opportunities. It must be uh, something that is worked on massively. But there are other kind of options which are not thought right now, is that we need to take care about the places where those inequalities develop. We need to pay a particular attention to those places. We need, I think, to have massive uh, programs uh, in order to sustain investment there, to support industry, or to help building new jobs, creating another part of industry there. The problem is that those territories uh, feel sometimes neglected. And that's the case everywhere. Because we see everywhere the same electoral behavior. After all, uh, the guy who votes Le Pen is not a far rightist voter always. He's somebody who feels apart from globalization and mad after the elites. The guy who voted Brexit is not a Londoner. He's not a young student. He's from the periphery. The Gilets Jaunes is quite the same. I'm afraid to say some, if I know a bit about the US, some Trump voters in some parts of America might have the same way to react. And even the blue colors in those traditional blue states who voted red in the last election in Michigan, Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, had that kind of attitude. So we need to have a, an inclusive approach there, uh, socially, economically, and also to reform capitalism. And that's, I think, one of the most important things that need to be, gone, to, to be done if we want liberal democracy to stay uh, the major model in the world. There is a fight between liberal democracy and populism now. There is a fight between uh, integration and nationalism. And for that, we need to absolutely address the issues of equal inequalities. If we don't, the cause is lost. Either you will see populists everywhere, or you will have div divided countries which are impossible to manage, impossible to govern, uh, and an impossibility to change. Uh, and that's why inclusiveness is certainly the answer. I spoke in the beginning of um, Jacques Chirac, when you say that he was perfect in all matters, but the idea that you need to take people together, you need to unify your countries, you need to listen to everybody with the same care, and we need to, you need to address even uh, those who are more in difficulty uh, with a stronger attention than the ones who are in the elites. That's what makes politics beautiful. How do you do that? Though? With what tools? Uh, I tried to, to, to explain yeah, the first in, horizontal... In, in investment uh, is one. Investment is, is certainly the key. Certainly the key. But investment locally, not only globally. Uh, if I look at, we spoke about American investment. Uh, uh, the people I met with you even two days ago, they are represent strong companies, wealthy people, they feel well, they invest in France, they invest in, in Germany, they invest in Paris, in Berlin, etc. Which one of them would invest in Montbéliard? Which is my town where I live. None. They don't even know where it is. So I think that uh, investment but also be not only global, but local. Uh, and if we don't have an, uh, an inclusive approach, then things will go apart. Slightly in the same vein, do you have any, um, do you pay attention and do you have any favorite 
Democratic candidates here in the US? I, I think if I would mention one, it wouldn't be a, a great favor. I, I, I remember I was here in 2004. I mentioned the um, position between France and the US on the Iraq war. And I was there to the Democratic Convention. It was uh, John Kerry who was the nominated uh, candidate. And I attended two wonderful speeches, one by Bill Clinton, always great uh, speaker. And there was one by a, a, a young guy who uh, then would become a senator, Barack Obama. And I told myself, this guy must be once uh, mm -hmm. candidate to the presidency of the I didn't imagine that he would be president next time. Um, and then I was with the French ambassador. At the time, it was uh, Jean-David Levitt. And we were together. And at one moment, th I was asked for an interview <coughs> by Fox News. And uh, the ambassador, who was more conservative than I am, but a good friend still, told me, Mr. Minister, I don't think you should do it. Because in the context, interviewing a French social democrat at the Democratic Convention wouldn't be a great help to the candidate. <laughs> so I if now I say, this is my favorite candidate, uh, I think the same answer would apply. I would just say one thing. The Democrats are a party which are, I would say, closer to the European mindset, obviously. I'm not talking and European in general, not only uh, this or that party. They must select a candidate who is capable of defeating or beating or winning the election. That's all. And uh, they must have that in mind when they vote. Uh, because, you know, for a party, there are always two temptations. The one is to have a pure identity. And that's what, for example, my party, the Socialist Party, did in 2017. They choose a candidate with, who was far left, more a dreamer, 6% in the end. Uh, and the other thing is to try to find candidate or candidates, and there are several probably in the democratic field, who are capable of also going over the ranks of their party and mobilize as well their own basis and the independence, because there are three thirds in the electorate everywhere, especially here. So I'm not giving names, but uh, I mean, for a party, try to win the election is always better. I've been seven years, I've been as long in my political life in power and in opposition, Finally, I prefer power. <laughs> uh, not, not because uh, because you, you can act a bit more. It's, it's, it's better. And also because sometimes there are danger of not being in power. But I'm al already telling too much, so I stop. All right. Okay, let's have one last quick question. No, I think that uh, the, the question which is raised there is obviously the question of regulation. Uh, and as I said, since we've got 28 countries, 27 maybe tomorrow, with uh, 27 regulators, 27 rules, that's obviously an obstacle. And that's why uh, at the EU level, we must have better regulation, which sometimes means uh, less regulation. And we must create also the uh, unity of our uh, rules. Uh, and for example, for digital. We try to build a digital single market. We have not completed it. That's one of the unfinished business of this commission. We've started, but uh, we need to pursue that. And uh, that's the only way to, to, to give the environment to companies to be uh, competitive uh, as much as the uh, American companies of that field. Great. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you, Pierre Moscovici. <laughs>